The world is filled with unbelievable stories, some of which are so far-fetched you might find yourself struggling to believe they're true. But as you'll see in this video, sometimes truth really is stranger than fiction. From a truly miraculous series of life-saving coincidences to the most ridiculous arrest story you'll ever hear, here are some of the most ridiculous stories that sound fake but are 100% real. Nutty Protest The world of politics is basically a hotbed for the stranger side of humanity. And in 2016, the election cycle curse that makes normal people do outrageous things in the name of their favorite politicians struck yet again. In a protest against Donald Trump's first presidential campaign, a 32-year-old Christina Ferguson did something so unusual even the police couldn't believe it. It all started on a quiet evening in October when Christina caught wind of a Trump supporter meeting in progress in a town hall building in Amherst Junction, Wisconsin. She interrupted the quiet gathering holding a family-sized jar of low-sodium, creamy Jif peanut butter. But she wasn't there to eat. Wielding the jar like a weapon, she began loudly ranting about Trump, causing such an uproar that she ended up being escorted from the building. It was only minutes later that a member of the meeting recalled the jar Christina had been wielding and suggested they went outside to see what she was up to. They were soon proven right to be suspicious, because as everyone piled outside, they saw her spreading the peanut butter on every car in sight. The shocked townsfolk approached Christina, but she quickly retreated to a nearby apartment complex, leading the meeting-goers to call the police and point them in her direction. The officers found Christina in an apartment with a man watching TV like nothing had happened. The man even gave her an alibi by insisting she'd been there all night. Which might have been believable if Christina wasn't standing there licking peanut butter off her fingers while talking to the police. That's right, she was literally caught peanut butter handed and she still claimed her innocence. Thinking she might have been intoxicated, the officers made Christina do a breathalyzer test, which she promptly failed. Luckily for the officers though, the drink in Christina's system made her all the more willing to talk. And it was only when she started talking that things became even more ridiculous than before. With tears in her eyes, Christina explained how much she loved Trump's opposing candidate, Hillary Clinton, and how spreading Jif across the cars was her way of protesting Trump's campaign. But the problem was, she wasn't exactly sticking it to Trump either, because it turned out she hadn't even interrupted the Trump supporter meeting. What she'd actually barged into was a meeting held by the Tomorrow River Conservation Club. Those poor people were likely discussing cleaning up a local river when Christina stormed in to yell at them, then proceeded to vandalize their cars. And the only real outcome of this hilariously ridiculous ordeal was the lesson that if you're going to make a political statement, make sure you're giving it to the right people. Impossible Odds Throughout the 1950s, at the West Side Baptist Church in Beatrice, Nebraska, choir practice on Wednesdays always kicked off strictly at 7.20 p.m. This was no different on the 1st of March, 1950, when Reverend Walter Klempel arrived in the afternoon to prepare the church. He lit the furnace, seeing as the evenings were chilly that time of year, and returned home for dinner. At 7.10 p.m., just as he was about to leave for choir practice with his family, they were held up when his daughter spilled food food on her dress. As she got changed, a frustrated Reverend Walter watched as 7.20 came and went, and they became officially late. Little did he know that his daughter's delay would end up saving their lives. At 7.25, a boom echoed across town as the West Side Baptist Church suddenly exploded. Its walls fell outward and the heavy wooden roof crashed to the ground. People across town rushed to the scene, including Reverend Walter. By the time he arrived, the fire brigade had already tamed the flames and searched the rubble for bodies. That's when one lucky coincidence took on a whole new level of strange. According to the firemen, the explosion was caused by a gas leak near the furnace, meaning the church could easily have blown up when Reverend Walter was there in the afternoon. But that's not all. At the time of the explosion, the church was empty, which was highly peculiar, seeing as choir practice should have already been in session. Where were the other choir members? Did they go into hiding somewhere, or had the firemen missed them in their search? 
Well, strap in, because the truth was absolutely mind-boggling. As it turned out, every one of the 15 members, like the Reverend and his family, ended up being late. And all for completely different reasons. Car trouble delayed two women, while others paused to complete homework, finish a letter, and hear the end of their favorite radio show. The church pianist, who took a nap after dinner, completely overslept, and her mother, the choir director, couldn't leave without her. Unbelievable, right? Seeing as there were no cell phones in the 1950s to shoot each other a text, there was no way for any of them to know others were also having trouble. But thanks to what you might call a genuine miracle, each member of the choir survived, completely unscathed. I'll bet that gave them something to sing about. And while we're on the topic of good timing, why not quickly press that subscribe button? And if you want to be early to any of my future uploads, be sure to click the bell too. It might just save your life. Now, on to the next unbelievable story. One with Nature In May 2012, 75-year-old retired teacher Ron Sveden from Brewster, Massachusetts wasn't feeling too well, to say the least. For months, he'd had a non-stop cough, shortness of breath, and seriously lacked energy, and things seemed to be getting worse. His wife Nancy was so alarmed by her husband's rapidly deteriorating health, she decided to call an ambulance. But when Ron arrived at the hospital and doctors took x-rays of his chest, they began to realize there was something seriously puzzling going on. Despite the x-rays revealing a grainy spot on Ron's left lung, doctors were unable to find any evidence of cancer or other diseases, which a blemish like that would usually indicate. Had Ron developed an illness that was yet to be documented? Or had doctors made a mistake when examining him? I hope you're sitting down because the answer would throw even the most experienced surgeon off balance. When sample tissue from Ron's lungs came back from the laboratory, doctors were shocked to find traces of plant matter in the specimen. And no, a member of the medical staff didn't drop their salad in the sample. As doctors examined the peculiar plant matter and carried out further tests, a truly jaw-dropping realization dawned on them. All those months Ron had been coughing and wheezing, he'd been walking around with a pea plant growing in his left lung. Now, I know what you're thinking. How is it even possible for a plant to grow in someone's lung? Well, when a pea plant germinates, it's usually underground in the soil. Using stored energy, it'll grow until it breaks the surface of the ground and can start photosynthesizing. But because it couldn't break out of Ron's body, the half an inch sized sprout just sat there, causing him a world of trouble. With the size of the plant inside though, the real question was how it came to be in Ron's lung in the first place. Most likely, Ron had been eating too fast and the pea slipped down his windpipe instead of his esophagus, in a rare phenomenon known as aspiration. As his choking reflexes failed to clear the pea from his windpipe, it ended up in his lung, where it eventually sprouted. Now, unfortunately, doctors weren't able to retrieve it the way it went down, and Ron had to be operated on to get the pea plant parasite removed. This did nothing to thwart his sense of humor, though. After the successful procedure, when nurses placed a big plate of peas in front of him, he merely laughed and gobbled them up. And when his friends and family bombarded him with pea-related gifts at home, he simply thanked them for saving his wife a trip to the grocery store. Personally, I'd have thought any type of pea joke would be a little too soon, but Ron said he wouldn't have it any other way. So next time someone tells you to eat your vegetables, let them know it might not be as healthy as they think. Human Male In 1965, not long after 19-year-old Brian Robeson left his home in Wales for Australia, he decided life down under wasn't for him. Not only was the weather too warm, he struggled to make friends and really missed his family. Unfortunately, earning very little, Brian couldn't afford a plane ticket back home, meaning he had to get creative. Uh, too creative, if you ask me, and you'll soon see exactly why. In a first attempt at freedom, Brian snuck aboard a ship bound for London. He used a visitor's pass to get on board and hid in the cargo hold until they set sail. But despite a promising start, 
Several hours into the voyage, Brian became violently seasick and was forced to seek the medical bay. As soon as his ruse was discovered, the crew escorted him off the boat and abandoned him in New Zealand. But Brian wasn't stranded for long. He secured some minor financial help from a relative in Australia, just enough to fly him back to Sydney, but sadly, not enough to get him back to the UK. On his return to Australia, however, he found himself coming up with a brand new plan, though it was even riskier than the first. Inspired by Reg Spears, a man who successfully mailed himself from London to Perth the year before, Brian decided traveling by crate on the postal service was the way to go. While in Australia, he approached Qantas Airlines to ask about the size of crates allowed to be transported and how much it would cost him. Even though his desired shipping crate size was more expensive than a passenger ticket, Brian planned on sending himself via cash on delivery, meaning he only had to worry about settling fees once back in London. Using forged company papers he got from a friend, Brian convinced Qantas that the crate would be carrying a large IBM 7030 computer and that it was being shipped to London for servicing. With his transport all set, Brian bought a crate from a builder's merchant. At 30 by 26 by 38 inches, it wasn't much bigger than the box of a standard front-loading washing machine, which, of course, would be quite a tight fit. Nevertheless, Brian had so much confidence in his plan that he immediately decided on a departure date. In preparation, he strengthened the crate and fitted it with a rope to secure him in place like a harness. The side of the box through which Brian climbed was nailed shut from the inside once he was in, and he packed a pair of pliers to open it back up when he touched down in London. Because Brian also took a large suitcase with him, it meant he had to sit with his knees pressed against his chest for the entire 36-hour journey. He couldn't stretch his legs and couldn't turn around. And even though the two pillows he packed made it comfy at first, he wouldn't stay comfy for long. On the 17th of May, with only a torch and two bottles to hand, one for water and the other for, uh, nature's emergencies, Brian's starting leg from Melbourne to Sydney began. He managed to smuggle himself on the plane just fine, but things quickly started to go wrong. At first, Brian's box was dumped upside down. But as he was helplessly strapped in, try as he might, he was crammed too tightly in the box to turn around. His neck soon started to throb and blood rushed to his head. Before long, he was in so much pain, he found himself continuously blacking out. Eventually, after spending 22 hours upside down, Brian's crate was turned upright and loaded onto another aircraft. But his problems didn't end there. What Brian didn't know was that the original Qantas flight ended up being overbooked, so the airline loaded him onto a Pan American aircraft with a longer flight route. This might have been okay under better circumstances, but with the cargo hold not being heated, Brian's situation became increasingly serious. From breathing difficulties to pain in his elbows and knees, his entire body was in absolute torture. Throughout the flight, Brian kept slipping in and out of consciousness, tormented by the nightmare of his crate being thrown out of the plane. By the time they touched down, Brian was in such pain he could barely find the strength to check the time on his watch. He did manage to turn on his torch, but it proved too heavy in his weakened state, and he dropped it out of reach. When the flight was over, a worker saw the torch's light and decided to investigate. Peering through a hole in the crate, he was shocked to see what looked like a dead body, and he wasn't far off, seeing as Brian himself felt as good as dead. The worker immediately summoned a team of doctors and customs officers who, after a heated debate about the crate's legal status, decided to break it open. Finally, Brian's ordeal was over. He had escaped Australia. But here's the kicker. He wasn't in London either. The startled officials, all of whom spoke with American accents, revealed to Brian's utter 
unbridled horror. He was actually in Los Angeles, nearly halfway across the world from his intended destination. It took a total of four officials to hoist Brian up and out of the crate, and as they laid him down, his legs refused to straighten. For hours, he was stuck in the position he'd wedged himself into for his journey. Still, the officials got him to the hospital, and Brian's story quickly gained the attention of the media. He also gained the attention of the FBI, who initially thought he was either a spy or that he'd been kidnapped. Having explained to them that neither of the accusations were true, the question remained about what to do with him. Luckily, the American authorities decided not to press any charges, but that didn't mean Brian was scot-free. Being named responsible for his fate as a stowaway, Pan American could have easily sent Brian back to Australia, but keen to ride the wave of publicity around his escape, they sent him to London instead. First class, and in an actual seat this time, no crates in sight. In total, Brian had spent four days inside the crate. He was honestly lucky to survive, and would likely have frozen to death had he been loaded onto that final leg from Los Angeles to London. Today, Brian is 75 years old, and thinking back, he says he regrets risking his life like that. Still, it didn't stop him from trying to cash in on what happened. Brian has written a film script about his totally crazy adventure, which he hopes might be picked up by a production company. Whether it will remains to be seen, but if it does, remember, you saw it here first. Senior Arrest In March 2020, Ruth Bryant was celebrating her 100th birthday at her assisted living community in North Carolina, when two sheriff's deputies entered the lounge area in search of her. They approached her where she was seated with her family and whipped out a pair of handcuffs. Ruth's daughter jumped up in her mother's defense, but the deputies completely disregarded her. They turned to Ruth and in spite of the surrounding birthday party decorations, moved in to arrest her. A 100-year-old woman living full-time in an assisted living community, and they were treating her like she was dangerous, and on her birthday. You might be thinking, did she rob a bank, or was she guilty of some unspeakably twisted crimes long ago that had finally been found out? The answer, well, was still surprising was definitely not worth the deployment of multiple officers. Ruth, much to everyone's astonishment, was being arrested for indecent exposure. And she didn't even try to deny it. She did, however, cause a big hubbub when the deputies cuffed her to her walker, even telling one of them that he was getting on her nerves. But that's not all. As they loaded Ruth into the police cruiser, she fought back by kicking one of the officers in the knee, Quite the feisty woman, isn't she? Well, Ruth's tough temperament didn't leave her daughter any less horrified as she watched her mother being driven to the station. At this point, the officers were probably equally horrified, seeing as Ruth wouldn't shut up. She continuously complained about the uncomfortable seats and even suggested that whoever designed them should be arrested. You might be able to see now why they sent two officers instead of one. At least if she drove one of them crazy, the other could stay sane just long enough to make it to the station. When they finally did, the deputies wasted no time in sitting Ruth down for a mugshot. One phone call and an orange jumpsuit later, Ruth's daughter arrived at the station, expecting to find her frail old mother wallowing in a cell. Instead, the scene was even more shocking than she imagined. Not only was Ruth not in distress, she wasn't even locked up. Instead, the entire station buzzed with laughter, the officers lining up to take selfies with a very happy Ruth. If you're seriously confused, you'd better join the queue, because Ruth's daughter had no idea what was going on either. Mere moments ago, the police were forcing Ruth into handcuffs, and all of a sudden, they were treating her like a celebrity. Well, at 100 years old, I guess Ruth practically was a celebrity. But that wasn't the reason for their smiles. As it turns out, the arrest was all one big gag that Ruth personally organized for her own birthday. Yep, Ruth had herself publicly arrested purely for the experience. 
You see, in an entire century's time, she'd never been in trouble with the law. And as one of her bucket list items, she wanted to tick it off. As adorable as that is, I doubt Ruth's daughter immediately found it quite so charming, especially after her mother's Oscar-worthy performance at the care home. But with the joke having run its course, Ruth posted her own bail in the form of a hug to the chief jailer, and soon she was back at the retirement home spending the rest of her birthday surrounded by friends, family, and lest we forget, a brand new criminal record. Have you encountered any true stories that sound truly unbelievable? Well, let me know down in the comments below, and as always, thanks for watching.